Good morning, HFA. Welcome to church. Are you ready to praise the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Stand with us. Just remember, it doesn't matter what songs we sing this morning. It's just important that we give praise to our Lord. Amen. Amen. I know.
We just thank you, God, for this day, Lord, which you have placed before us. Father, the awesomeness of your love, Lord Jesus. Lord, the way you show up, God, even in the midst of trying times, Lord, you're still present among your people. And God, this morning, as we stand here, Lord, before you, I just pray, Lord, that if there's someone here, Lord, or maybe watching on the, on the live stream cast, Lord, that you would just even right now begin to minister your words into their heart, Lord, and into their mind. Father, we're just so thankful that we even have the opportunity, Lord, to come together. Lord, sometimes we take that for granted, Lord. We forget that we do have the freedoms to come together as the church. And Lord, this morning I would pray, Lord, those individuals that are at home, Lord, many that are sick in body, Lord, my good friend Mickey, who stands in a mirror, uh, needs a miracle in his life, Lord. I pray right now that you would just touch him, Lord, there at, at the hospital, God. And for Billy Grimsley, Lord. Father, for the many, many folks, God, that, you know, that we receive uh, prayer requests for, Lord. The little, the little uh, young man there in Morgantown, Lord, Joshua, who, who drowned, Lord. 
Father, but you saw fit to restore him, God. And Father, we just thank you for the many miracles and the blessings which you give to us daily. Lord, may we never, ever lose sight of that fact, God, that you're still present in our midst, Lord. And we thank you, God. Lord, as we receive your word here in just a few moments, God, I pray that you would give us an ear to hear what you are saying to us, God. The words that come forth, God, that they're, they're from you, Lord. They're not just from mortal man, but they're from, they're from heaven. They're God-breathed, Lord. Jesus, we thank you ahead of time, Lord, for what you're going to do, for what's going to take place in the hearts of the individuals that are a part of this cast or this service here live. And we just give you honor and we give you thanksgiving and praise. And all of God's children said, Amen. You may be seated. It's so good. Thank you, praise team, for the wonderful job this morning. We're just so blessed to have a, a, an amazing team that come out and serve every week, even through the midst of the pandemic. These folks were very faithful in showing up and on Sunday mornings, and we just so appreciate them. I'd also like to say it's good to see some of you that I haven't seen for a while. I see Angel back here, who I haven't seen in a while. It's good seeing her and Seth and some of the others that I have not seen. And uh, I, the other day, I, I was joking around with Margaret and Wes about, about Robert. I hadn't seen him for a couple weeks. And it, it's been a couple months, and he walks up to him, and he's like three inches taller than me now. I'm like, what happened to Robert? He was this little kid a couple months ago, and boom, now he has a mustache, and he's tall. It's just amazing to see how the kids are growing up. My wife said she saw Crystal and Stephen yesterday at the produce stand, and she said she couldn't believe how much they've grown. And it's just amazing how God is still in the middle of all that we're seeing and all that's taking place. So let's not lose sight of that. But it's good to see everyone. We're just so welcome to have you here as part of our service. And those that are watching online, I have a few friends that are watching, and I'd like to give a shout out to them, uh, you know, then say thank you for, for tuning in. It's just a pleasure and an honor to be in God's house. Can we say amen? So who's ready to dive into the Word this morning? Amen. One, as Gerald Mayhem said, one, two. Okay, everybody's with me this morning, right? It is an honor and a privilege to serve, and it's an honor and a privilege to be able to bring forth word. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking to our, our graduates. As you know, today we are selling it, celebrating our graduates from either high school or college or, or whatever they had graduated from. We're going to be talking about that today. Uh, but seeing our purpose, seeing our purpose, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, back in the beginning of the year, as a youth group, we tried to come up with a theme every year. We try to, uh, you know, Bonnie has always really uh, pushed that to and said, come up with a theme. It's a great way to market. It's a great way to come up with something you can stick with throughout the year, and that's a great idea. And, and you know, we came up with see-through was our, was our theme. And, you know, because the year is 2020. Now, how many of you wish you still had 2020 vision, Right? Okay, now I can see some of you, but not everyone. It used to be that I had great vision. I could see everything very clearly. And I had to, uh, at the age of 35 to 40, so that tells you I'm older than that, even though you thought I was younger. Thank you for thinking that, but I know I'm not. But I had to get glasses to see clearer. And you know, we're going to dig into God's Word, and that's what we need to see clearer sometimes, amen? But I want these young individuals, and you as adults even, ones that are home, to be able to see our purpose, to see what it's all about. And, I, and I really, that's what I want to talk to you about. When Pastor Jeff had asked me to speak, immediately I started thinking about that. It just came to mind. God really pressed it upon my heart. And I, and I pulled up the book of Daniel. I love the book of Daniel, if you haven't noticed. I've preached out of Daniel probably in the last year more than I ever have in my entire life. And, and I just love his book. We studied it as a youth group, and I just found a lot of interesting facts facts, and a lot of really good sermon titles came out of that. Uh, I, me personally, for my own self, you know, uh, learning, and, and th I listen to a lot of other speakers, a lot of other pastors. I try to listen. I listen sometimes to Stephen Furtick. I love his energy. How many know that sometimes, I, I was talking to Joel yesterday, he said, I love energy when someone speaks, and, and we know that, you know, God really ministers to me. I don't know about you, but when I hear his word. So if you would, if you would, you know, Indulge me for just a few moments out of the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 9, verses 3 through 5, and you can just follow along on the screen, or if you have your iPhone or your tablet and you have the, the scriptures on there, I know many of the students do. And here's what it says. It says, then I turn my face to the Lord, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 
I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, thy great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again for another day. We can take a moment to thank you for uh, the, your provision of your word. Lord, that you would just use it, God, this morning to uh, speak into our hearts and our minds exactly what you want us to hear, God. And we just give you honor and praise for that. And everyone said, amen. Um, the book of Daniel was written from the life, obviously, from Daniel, who was a prophet, who was born to the tribe of Judah. He had a gift of interpreting dreams, and God had given him much wisdom and favor. When you read that book, it's all about the favor and the wisdom that he had. He is the Daniel, of course, we know is from the lion's den of most of you that have children have read that story numerous times. He is also the same Daniel who was friends with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were thrown into a fiery furnace. They all lived at the same time, and he was actually friends with them. In the chapter of Daniel 9 here, he is praying for forgiveness for his, the nation of Israel who had committed sin against the Lord. He pleaded for God to restore them or the holy city. His theme that unveils itself in verse 17 and 19 says this. He said, now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Oh, my God because your city and your people are called by your name. When you read that there in Daniel, it, you know, earlier he speaks about at the beginning of chapter nine there of the, the prophecy Jeremiah had actually indicated of a seven year of captivity. Daniel had obviously read or heard that. He had, he had read that or he had and studied it or he had heard that. Daniel has seen God, his hand uh, work in a time when his nation was under siege and was put into captivity. He first would serve under uh, the Babylonian empire of King Nebuchadnezzar, as many of you know when you read that chapter. The name Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, the same Nebuchadnezzar who had a dream that Daniel would later interpret. It was about, you know, about the coming kingdoms. In Daniel 2, he reveal, reveals this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And he this is what he says, he hears of this dream, uh, you know, and, and he, he, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and no one can, none of his sorcerers or magicians or anyone can figure it out. But Daniel, you know, does figure it out. But how does he do that? He pleads to the Lord. And later, he hears of this dream and he, and he talks to him and he interprets it and he was placed in a higher position because of that. Daniel also goes to his friends before he interprets it and, and talks about it. And he says, hey, guys, let's pray about this. He, he, he reveals this secret of this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is thanking God here in Daniel 2, 20 through 23, of a time, you know, that he would reveal this dream to him. And I want to read it to you so I kind of get to where I'm heading. And here's what he says. He says, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to those and knowledge to those who, who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in darkness. Oh God of my fathers, you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Now, as a Christian today, we always say we want God's will to be done. Can we say amen? That's a common phrase I hear, and sometimes I speak that as well. But the reality is, is that really what we seek? Is that really what we're after in this day and time? Do we see in the midst of all that's going on around us, do we seek out the purpose we exist, or do we exist to fulfill our own purpose? There are some monumental, you know, times in your life or moments in your life, things like being born, your first crush, how many can remember that? 
marriage, your first child, and yes, graduating from high school or from college. These are moments when things change. Moments I, I call pivotal points. It's like getting your driver's license for the first time. How many of you can remember that moment? It's like, wow, dad, I can drive by myself? Wow, that's insane. Uh, they were a little bit, you know, somebody was wrong for giving me a driver's license at that age, but just throwing that out there. But at birth, you are given life. Your first crush, you begin to understand puppy love, but you also understand rejection from time to time. Marriage, you discover how to share life with a significant other in the ups and in the downs. Can we say amen? When your first child comes, you get the experience, uh, you know, parenthood. Also, the late, as Dylan and Michaela could probably write a book on right now, was the late night sleeps or not sleeping or lack of, amen? At graduation, you receive a confirmation of success or accomplishment. You have finally gotten through it, but you, you also experience the life-changing realization that now it's time for me to work and earn my own paycheck. And mom and dad just said, amen to that. Many of us have stories of these pivotal transitional times in our lives. My favorite story that anyone ever phrased people say to me, and probably everybody in here that's over the age of 30, I'm gonna say has probably said this before. Maybe, maybe that number's 50, I don't know. I wish I could be 18 and know what I know now. How many have ever said that before? One, two, pr pretty much everybody in here has probably said that. I've said it a thousand times. And my, when I was 18 and my dad said, I'm like, what's he talking about, man? I would, honestly, I don't want to be 18 again. I'm just saying. But I've heard that statement said many times. It's funny to me because life comes at us at such a super speed of light. One day you're going into kindergarten and the next moment you're receiving a diploma, completing another level of education. And, and it's just like, boom, it happened. Mom and dad, how many can relate to that? It seemed like yesterday that your child was being born and today they're graduating. If there's any advice that a, that a person who has a child graduating, Cheryl could, could relate to this because Jacob is graduating. But one moment he's this little baby and like, like you know, at Xander in the back is, is a little baby. But before you blink, he's going to be walking across the stage to receive a diploma. That's how quickly life comes at us. We can all agree life is full also of transition and change. Can we say amen? We are in a world of continuous transition. Some of you here today are in a time of transition. People in here that have stories to tell, you're in transitions all the time, different ways. The life you knew that you knew looks way different from several months ago. That it, there's been a big transition in our lives. We went from packing gyms and stadiums and subways and streets to ghost towns and empty arenas. We can't even, like I turn on the Korean baseball league. I've learned to know the teams because there's no baseball going on and there's no one in the stands. They have, they have like monograms of people sitting in the stands where before that would have been packed full of people. We've all, all been cooped up like my grandmother used to pack her chickens in this coop so the, the animals couldn't get to them. I feel like that. I've been home so much and I've enjoyed it, don't get me wrong, but I've missed you know, my time with my friends and being able to go out and do things. Daniel saw several historical changes in his lifetime. He would, this took place 600 plus, uh, around 600 years before Jesus would even come on the scene for another monumental transition. Can we say amen? First, he was part of the royal subjects that Nebuchadnezzar would, would take over when he overthrew Jerusalem. When he came in, he, he moved them right into his kingdom, into his, into his palace, so to speak, as a servant. His name got changed from Daniel to Belshazzar. He was forced to bear the name of a foreign nation. He uh, went from a prince to a slave right off the bat. He went from maybe a position here to in being royalty to, you know, he worked in the palace, but he was not maybe, you know, at the beginning, he obviously wasn't one of the princes. We know from Scripture, Daniel did find favor and wisdom with his interpretation of dreams. God had gifted him with that. In Daniel 1.20, it says that he was 10 times more wise than any of the magicians or astrologers of the king's you know, kingdom. He was that much more wise. It was God-given. Can we say amen? Not just one time did he experience transition, but he experienced it several times. If you do a study, he served under Nebuchadnezzar, then he transitioned to Belshazzar. This is the one who saw the handwriting on the wall. Then he went to Darius the Mede, who was a Persian, and also to Cyprus the Persian. He served under 
those four different kings, and there were two different empires involved in that. Not only were they kings, but there were different even empires to come, that, that were world-changing. I would say he probably had a, a degree of transition. He probably passed that class, would we say amen? Today, as we celebrate, you know, some of you who have completed your respected levels of education to receive a, either a high school diploma or a college studies of your choice, I would say congratulations. Jacob, congratulations. Riley, if you're here, congratulations. Elizabeth, if you're here, congratulations. Many of us, whatever the case may be, life will change at this very moment. Things will be different. How many can say amen that graduated? It's going to be different. The many years of getting up to catch the bus or to reading a book or studying this or that, preparing for a big test or walking to class, staying up late to finish the last minute project. How many of you parents have done that before? Uh, it's due tomorrow, and I knew about it like 10 minutes before bedtime, right? I've, I've done that before. As I was preparing my sermon today, I was thinking about those moments in my own personal life, thinking of, you know, the things that I could share to possibly help you out as a young person, you know, graduating. Now that you have completed this journey, no one, a new one will begin. Can we say amen? You've, you've, you've ran this race, now another race is about the beginning. Many of us, even myself, may have not asked myself this question many times though. What's my purpose? You know, what's the purpose in all of this? I mean, I don't know about you, but I know people that are, that are walking through things and they're like, why is this, you know, God, what is the purpose in all this? You ever done that before? Is it just me? I mean, I've had times in my life where I'm like, God, why in the world is this taking place? I can think of even moments where I'm like, you know, I've told this story many times, even when, when, when my son went through what he went through many years ago, I'm like, God, why is this taking place? Or, you know, when my parents were in that tragic accident, or, you know, the accident that basically crippled my mom, why did that take place? And the whole time, God just kept saying to me, there's a purpose. There's a purpose. I remember Melinda one time, we had a long conversation. Those of you that don't know Melinda, or, or most of you do, she knew everyone, but many of you that may be watching online, Melinda was our secretary who, who uh, had cancer and eventually it took her life. And one day she and I were here and we were talking, it was on a Monday morning, and she said, you know, Trevor, I don't know why. I don't know. I can't explain why that I, that I got this. I, I can't tell you why. She said, all that I know is, is that in the middle of all of this, I know that God has a plan. I know that God has a purpose for it. I don't know who's being reached. I don't know what God's doing. I just know that God is navigating something to take place. So for me, I thought about this, and I said, I believe the first step in figuring out how to understand is how we got here. Literally, how do we get to this point in life, or how do we get here? First of all, we are a design off of God's blueprint. Only he could create. Jacob, when God created you, he's the only one that could do it the way he did. He's the only one that could create you for who you are. He's the only one that has the ability to create someone like yourself. Can you think about that? When you think about the human body, how it's intricately and it's so complicated how it works. My son has a biomedical degree, and he talks about, he and my wife are talking back and forth because she works at the hospital. You know, she, she knows the anatomy, and they're talking back and forth, and I'm like, whatever. You know, just, you guys go over there. I'm going to watch sports, right? I mean, it's kind of like that because there's so many things that, are, that they're talking about, but the enormous amount of, of just, it, it overwhelms me how the body works. How, the, how God put us together and knit us together the way that he did. It's just incredible. And he did that to me. Nothing on earth, nothing has ever matched the wonders of the human being. The Bible says in Genesis 1.27 that God did what? He created mankind in his own image. You are an image of God. How many like knowing that you are an image of God? In the image of God, he created them. Now, here's the key. Male and female, he created them, right? So we're, we're all an image of God. In Psalms 139, it says, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. So when Xander was, was when he was being formed in, in his mama's womb, 
God knew every integral part of him. He knew he was going to come out and what he was going to look like. I, I think of Thad and I think of, of, of you know, Crystal's children, uh, Skylar, River, and Barrett. And I look at those children. It's just amazing to me how God creates us the way he, that he does. It's funny how, you know, when I look at, I look at uh, Zach's little boy and he looks just like him. When I look at Victoria's son and I'm like, wow, it's little Zach the second. It's amazing to me how God does that. I don't know about you, but I'm just amazed by children, how God puts them together. Isaiah says this. He said, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands. So God is the one always forming and shaping us, amen? He formed us. Job, in the midst of his tragic event that was taking place, can you imagine living in the, in the sorrow that he was walking in? He said, your hands fashioned and made me. Even in the midst of the worst time of his life, he still acknowledges, acknowledged that God was his creator and formed him. God created because God was, God is, and God will always be. Can we say amen? In Colossians 1, 15 and 16, here's what Paul says. He said, he, meaning Christ, is the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So let's think about this. To start out with, we can all agree that we're all created images of God. As I stated earlier, we are his blueprint. We are his handiwork. He came up with our design. He made us in his image. Some of us might be a little shorter. Some of us might be a little taller. But God created us in his image. He created every one of you. Just like David, Isaiah, Job, and Daniel. When we begin to come with the grips that with the that the truth that God is the one that fashioned everything, including us into existence, all things are because he chose you. Think about that. He chose you as an individual to create. The very fact that God said, I'm gonna make you Crystal. I'm gonna make this girl named Crystal and this is what she's gonna look like. Here's what her personality is gonna be like and, I, and she's my daughter. I created her to be exactly who I wanted her to be. When he, you know, he, he looked at David and he's like, there's this little baby that's gonna be born. His name's gonna be David. I already have his name picked out in his mother's womb. Before he was even born or thought of, his name was already chosen. And, and, and David, can you imagine when your parents held you for the first time and, and God's looking down like, there's my boy. See, God created you. Think about that. Think of something that you yourself have created. Think of something that maybe is sitting on a shelf at home. Maybe something that you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, but maybe something at home that you have created or fashioned. Think about how much pride you put into it. You ever build something and, and go, wow, I'm just, this is so awesome, or maybe a flower decoration or something you hang on the wall? It's amazing to me how much, how much we really enjoy looking at that. I mean, Penny, you work on furniture. It, it, it's amazing to watch your creativity, but to me, it's like, wow, or, you know, God, God did that, and Crystal, you know, that voice God gave you that. Can you imagine? I, I wish God would have gave me that. I, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be like, see, Crystal, he gave me one too. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be like, I can sing now? That's pretty awesome. My daughter's like, please, Lord, let that happen beforehand. I sing off key. I sing, Brad Huddleston said this one time. He said, you sing notes God can't even invent. I mean, it's, it's that bad. Maybe not quite that bad, but sometimes I do sing off key. They turn the mic off when I start singing. <laughs> The better we can begin to understand our purpose, the better we can come to understand why we are here. You can start to understand why you are here. Now, some of you are mom and dad. Some of you, are, you know, understand that. Jeremiah 1.5 says this. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. He said, I ordained you before you were even born. You're gonna be a prophet to the nations, Jeremiah. He also told, you know, he told uh, Moses in Exodus 3, he said, I'm going to make you a deliverer of this nation, and you're going to take them back to the land I promised Abraham. He said, I'm going to use you in a way that you didn't even think was possible. Yep, you did. You messed up. You, you killed an Egyptian. You did things that 
you probably shouldn't have done, but you also have the voice that I have given you. And he stuttered. If you read the story of Abraham, he stuttered. He, he was not perfect. He made mistakes, but God used him. So why are we here? Later, Jesus would call 12 disciples. If you know anything about the disciples, you will know that some of them were fishermen. They were, they were probably not the highest education around, but God used them. He took these men and he took these women who later would come along and follow his gathering and he would use them to reach the world for, with his gospel. If you follow the worldview, they might say this to you, eat, drink, and be merry. Have you ever heard that or seen that sign before? Some say you're born, you live, and then you die. I don't believe that. If you look in the Garden of Eden, how man had a personal fellowship with God, and when asked, was only, all they were asked to do is just be obedient and not eat from one tree. This was the original design. God wanted to have fellowship with us. That was his original design. He wanted to spend time with man, but our sin separated us from him, just like today. Sin does what? It separates me from God. So then Jesus came, and he, he connected us back to the Father. Can we say amen? Isaiah, Isaiah 43 says this, God said, everything, everyone who is called by my name, who I have cre created for my glory. The ones that are called by my name, who I have created for my glory. Write this down. Highlight this. Put it on your, tag it on Instagram. Put it on Facebook. Maybe even TikTok if you have that. I wouldn't recommend it, but maybe that's you. You know, maybe you roll in that circle. But here's the scripture I wanted to key on today. Young person graduating, young person still in high school, elementary age, no matter what. For we are his handiwork, or we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Think about that scripture for just a moment. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. First, God created us to worship and serve him. Could someone please give me some water, please? God created us to worship and serve him. Secondly, he wants us to work for his glory. He wants us to do that. And third, he wants us to offer ourselves as a sacrifice of service to him. Did you hear what I said? He created us to worship and to serve him. He wants us to work so he gains glory. He, working to be Christ-like, being dependent on him in all things. And here's what he told Jeremiah in, in Jeremiah 29. He said, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, we, we love that scripture, do we not? We write it on every, we have it on our refrigerators. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanner. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. Excuse me. There we go. Daniel followed that advice. When you read the book of Daniel, he followed through with that. David said this. He said, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. I cry out to him because he fills his purpose for me. This is when he was running from Saul. If you know the story, he was running from Saul who was chasing him to take his life. That's when David spoke those words. We know from our Bible studies, or if you've, you've been into scripture, later David would, be, would become one of the greatest kings. He was the second king of Israel and he would become a, an, a distant, distant ancestor of Jesus Christ himself. Is that the model? Is that the model that we apply to our lives? Is our daily life based upon these principles to honor and to serve him, working for him so he gains glory, sacrificing our own wants and our own desires to truly surrender to his? Can we say amen? When I think of purpose, I think of things like intentional, determination, having an objective, setting goals, in a career-oriented workplace, acting on these fundamental behaviors can drive a person to great success. If I went around this room and said, what are some determining factors that gave you success in whatever that you've done? These are the things that people might say. I was intentional, I worked hard. I was determined I was gonna do really good things. I had an objective to accomplish these goals that I set. Those are things that I work towards. As a young person, 
getting ready to embark, Jacob, on life. These simple applications can help you expand your potential in anything that you try to do. And Jacob's one of those kids, or young men, I should say, that I know will be successful because he carries those type of characteristics about him. Excuse me. Are you praying to God to speak into your situation? More like a revelation. I don't know about you, church, but I need a revelation. We need a revelation as a church like never before. Daniel probably had moments when he wanted to give up. He probably had moments where, you know, what's going on here? Why is this taking place? But instead of getting discouraged, he prayed. He sought the God, it says the God of his youth or the God of his fathers. And, and the key to that is, is that means all the things that he did were instilled in him from a young child. Those were the things and the customs that he were taught. It was the God of his fathers. Young person, as you leave the nest of home to become your own individual, make sure your travel, your planner of life travel plans have God in the mix of everything that you do. Everything and every decision you make, put God in the midst of all of that. And listen, I say that, I say that, but do I always do that? Can I be honest with you? I'm gonna be transparent, I don't. And sometimes I make mistakes, amen? Sometimes I fail. But here's the key on failure. Don't allow, allow that to be an option. You're like, well, we're gonna make mistakes, of course. Failure is not always measured by when we mess up or when we fail, per se. It's when you, failure is when you're willing to give up or not even try at all. It's like you're like, I'm just giving up. I'm not even gonna try. Or I'm just gonna say, I don't, I'm, I'm just not going any further than this. Can you imagine, are you praying to God for that? Are we asking him to help us in those moments? He will see you through. God will see you through. I had a conversation this week with someone who said, you know, God gets credit sometimes for things that he really didn't plan for us. He gets credit for things that we do on our own, and we just throw that out there as a cliche and say, it's God's will, when in reality, it's not something that he had planned, it's something that we had planned. Most people want to take this path. Some people want to take this path. Sometimes one of least resistance or a direction that I want for myself. How many have ever done something and you did it based on what you wanted? Just one person? One, two. We do that, don't we? Amen? Or the direction, uh, you know, we want to credit ourselves for the wins and we want to give the devil credit for our losses when in reality, sometimes it's our failures. Just like Daniel, the path to God's purpose might not have been down the very road that he wanted to take. If I would have been Daniel, I would have been like, God, I want you to put me in a position and leader where I'll be the king. You know, that's the kind of mentality I may have had, but that's not the plan that God had placed for. Sometimes we have to take a very different way to discover God's purpose. Can we say amen? Excuse me for my voice. I'm, it's, I'm losing my voice for whatever reason. Maybe God wants me to shut up, right? <laughs> Daniel and his friends had to learn new language they were not Persian. They weren't from Babylon. They didn't speak Aramaic. They were Hebrew. He had to be, they had to be exposed to false gods and teaching. They had to learn the language. He forced them to serve other God, kings, and they all got new names. From uh, Bel, they, they became Belshazzar, and then Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah all became known as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Those were not their original names, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That was their names when they would not bow, bow down. But what would have happened if Daniel or his friends would not have fulfilled the purpose that God had planned for them? Think about this. Maybe, just maybe, the lions would have had dinner that day. And you know what I'm saying when I, when I mention that. Or maybe that furnace would have just been hot enough to burn up those three, three Hebrew men. Amen? If they would not have fulfilled the plan, they would not bow down. Even though they were told a decree of a statue was placed, they would not bow down. They're, that was the, the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. We can tell that many, many sermons can be preached on that. But they would not kneel down before. They, they would not defy their God. Out of my deepest struggles can some of my, become of my greatest victories. Let me say that again. I mispronounced it. Out of my great, deepest struggles can come some of my greatest victories. I said that to someone literally yesterday in that, in that term. Maybe up to this point in life, 
God really hasn't had the opportunity to be involved in your life choices. Maybe that's something that you're just like, well, I've been just kind of floating along. Maybe you didn't take the, the time to allow God to give you direction. I can say that. I know I'll share that in just a couple minutes. Maybe you're someone who really didn't follow any of the guidelines of following Jesus and your personal relationship with him is very weak or it may even be non-existent. I've had moments like that in life. I, I, I'm just being honest with you. There are times when I do that. The Bible says that God told Jeremiah to call me and I will answer. He said, just call upon me and I will answer you. <clears throat> so here's a question. God sees you. What are you going to do now? Where are you going to go from here? Jacob, where are you going to go from here? As my son comes up, here's a quote that I thought was very interesting and really, not, really awesome. I heard it, and I thought it was really good. The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. And that was written by Mark Twain. <clears throat> the day you are born and the day that you discover why. This week, Lydia and I were we were joking around, we were talking, and she said, I think it'd be neat to know what is going to happen in the future. She said, I think it'd be really cool. I think it'd be awesome. I said, well, I don't know about you, Lydia, but I'm just speaking from my own personal view. If I knew what was going to take place, I probably, be, probably would get into trouble. Can we say amen? I'd be like, if I knew that Jesus was going to wait till you know, March 15th, 2021, I'd be like, Dude, I, there's some stuff I want to get done, you know. I'm just being honest. I, I, and I said, you know, as we were talking, she said, yeah, that's true. We don't know the day or the hour. Not even the angels, not even Christ himself knows when God's going to come, when Jesus is going to return for his bride at the church. And You know, I think when I was thinking about, you know, a, a, a sermon or a lesson, I thought about my own life. And I'll just share that with you. If you would have told me of the year of 1986, that just tells you how old I am, that I'd be walking, when I was walking across the stage to receive my diploma from high school, that 30 years from that moment, 30 plus years, I'd be standing in a country where a pandemic has literally shut down the economy. I would have said, no way. That's what I would have thought. I was young. I didn't, I didn't watch the news. I watched sports, right? If you would have told me that 30 plus years ago, I would be standing on a stage ministering to my friends and my church family, I would have said, you're out of your mind. There's no way. I want to go to college. I want to go begin, you know, working. I want to go, I want to have a car. I drove a, a car that was a piece of junk. I wanted a new car, Russell. How many wanted a new car, right? If you would have told me even 20 years ago that I would be serving Jesus today, I would have said, there's no way. But let me tell you what happened in that transition over those years. And this, this is kind of a testimony, and then I'm done. I was, I was in sales, and I had these P individuals those transitional moments in my life where I had to see what God had placed before me. And it, and it breaks me up inside to think about what God has seen me through because I was not serving the Lord. I was playing in a rock band, true story. I was playing in a rock band. We were running up and down the Shenandoah Valley playing in bars, clubs. It wasn't a place for me to be. I had a wife. And all of a sudden, this little baby was born. He's standing right there. Three months into Tanner being born, he, he had contracted double pneumonia in his chest. He was coughing really bad. It was New Year's Eve, 1996 into 1997. And I was, I'll be honest with you, I was drinking with my buddies. We were at this bar. I got home at four in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. You should not be out at four o'clock in the morning up to no good, amen? And the Lord in that moment said to me, I called you years ago. My wife was really upset. And she said, you have got to quit. I can't do this on my own. And I said, I will. 
Literally at 4.30 in the morning, I called the leader of the band. I said, I quit. I can't do this. I can't. I got a new job. Several years later passed. I had this guy named Donnie Dean who started speaking into my life. Some of you here know him. He started talking to me about God. And I was cussing and being a heathen and I was acting up. He said, Trevor, you know better. And then I met Russell Whitmer one day and I walked into his office and he's like, you need to come to church one Sunday. I've told this story a lot of times, but I appreciate it, Russell. I appreciate him for that. He will always be somebody I look up to for the fact that he had the courage to say, come to church. Dude, let me tell you what happened. Now I can get away from my notes. I walked in the door, Pastor Jeff didn't even have to preach and the power of God was already talking to me. The spirit of God was already like, "Mm mm-hmm. You've been running for a long time and now it's time to come home. I was here probably a couple months. Pastor Jeff said, came up to me one Sunday and said, I've noticed you came in the, we had two services at the time. He said, would you help me with uh, communion this morning? Uh Uh-oh, you mean I gotta get up in front of people? Yeah, you just walk up and hand this around. You know how we do the trays. And then he said, would you pray over the bread? Now, I'm in trouble, right? I bowed my head and said the simplest prayer I could say to get done so I could go sit down. But the whole time, the whole time I was away from the Lord, he kept saying, Trevor, at the age of 17, 18 years old, I spoke to you in an audible voice and you heard me. He said, I spoke into you that I wanted you to be my child. I wanted you to be in ministry. And I'll be honest with you. Even before Pastor Jeff ever asked me to be the leader of the youth ministries where it all began in 2005, Pastor Jeff could tell you the story. I had no clue that was going to happen. I was working a full-time job, had a great job. Pastor Jeff walks up to me one night, calls me into his office. I was working full-time, and he said, Trevor, he said, the youth pastor's leaving, and he had mentioned that you're really involved. Would you like to be in charge for a while? I was like, Uh, yeah, okay. Then I started thinking, God. Went to youth convention for the first time, 2005. It was called Fuel. We got a big gas can we got to bring home. That's when they brought things home with you. Sorry to go so long. But I want want to hit something here. I believe there's individuals in here today just like that. I believe there's transitions that you're going through and you don't know why. There's things that God has spoken into you and you have been dormant. Can we, can we say amen? There are people that God wants to use. He, and, and young person, I, 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 Jacob, I know it. I know it. Others of you as well, you have things that God has instilled in you. The end of my story is this. Eventually, Pastor Jeff said, you know, we may have a position come available. And eventually, you guys know, thanks to a lot of you in here, I became involved in ministry here, took classes and and got a degree, you know, to have the license to preach and the whole story that taking all those classes. Now, I had a lot more notes and I'm not going to go into them. People today, we have a purpose to honor the Lord. Daniel, in the worst of times, used that same model. He said, God, I need your help. We, we've, we've messed up, we've sinned, we've fallen. And church, if there's ever a time when your kids need to know Jesus, it's today. There is a, I, I, I'm telling you, I know. I know what your kids are doing. I know what they're doing. Trust me. You're like, what, what do you mean? There are things that the enemy have placed before our children that are pulling on them like, Horses tied to a rope just jerking on them. The enemy is smart. He's crafty. What does John 10, 10 say? The enemy wants to do what? He wants to steal. He wants to kill and he wants to destroy. But Jesus said, I came to give you life. I came to give you life. Why would we want our children, why would we want them to receive, you know, what the enemy offers? Why wouldn't we want to give them what Jesus offers? So this morning as we bow our heads for the, you know, as we close, 
Maybe you're here today and you would say, man, you know, it was long and your voice was blowing up on you and I apologize for that. But I believe that the Holy Spirit has poked a few of you this morning. I just sense it in my heart that there are people in here that have been running from the Lord. If that's you, you don't have to come up front. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, simply do this, just, just so I can acknowledge it. It's not so I can call you out. I want you to say, I'm that person. I'm the one that maybe God was ministering to this morning. I want you to slip your hand up real quickly and then put it back down. There's one, there's one. There's another. Bless you this morning. Maybe you're that person this morning and you would say, I have served the Lord, I've been in church, but I'm really not at a place where I'm truly seeking God's purpose. And I want God's purpose to be fulfilled in my life. If that's you, just slip your hand up and then slip it back down. If that's you, bless you. God's amazing. For those of you that raised your hand and said, you know, I want to have a relationship with Jesus, simply do this. Just say, in, in this quiet moment, I want you to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Receive me into your kingdom. I confess with my mouth that you are the son of the living God and you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again on the third day and you are now seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. You're the, you're the Jesus I want to serve faithfully from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As simple as that prayer is, if you're here today and, and, and you don't have to pray in this moment, take this word of seeing God's purpose for you. Some of you are moms. Some of you are dads. Your purpose, that, that, that could be your purpose. I heard, I heard a sermon one time and the guy was talking about, he said, what, what do you think Billy Graham's parents were thinking? Think about that for a moment. A man who reached millions of people. Joel. Where's Joel? Joel, raise your hand. This man right here, Joel, told me this story. He said, I said, can you remember when you received Jesus? He says, yeah. One day I was listening to Billy Graham. Young man right here. He said, I listened to a Billy Graham sermon, and it began to resonate in my spirit. He said, when he said the prayer, I received Jesus into my heart. That's a great story, isn't it? What if you are raising a Billy Graham? I'll bet you, I'll bet you my parents had no clue. No, I'm not nobody special. But I'll bet you my parents would sit back and go, wow. I'm just telling you, God is so faithful. God is so good. I look around this room and I see many of you, many of you that God has called. In different capacities. Not everybody's going to preach on Sunday morning. That's not what I'm talking about. You can be a minister in your job. The story I told you about Russell. You can be a godly example in your school. You can be the one who leads Bible studies. You can be the one who, who speaks goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness. You know, you can begin to speak that into your friends. I just, I just love you guys, and I want you to know that God is good. Amen? So as I close in prayer, I want you to remember to continue to pray for us. Thank you for all of you that have continued to be faithful in your giving. We could not function without you. And we so appreciate that. You have no idea how much we as a church staff so appreciate your giving to us. You keep us, you keep the doors open to our church. For those that are online watching, we thank you for your faithfulness as well. So let's close in prayer and then we will, we will start dismissing. Before that, we're going to do uh, you know, a graduation celebration. So let's just bow our heads. Lord, we're so thankful that we have you. God, to minister into our hearts. Lord, as you, uh, God, I just, it, I'm at amazement of how you work, God, in our lives. Lord, I would pray right now if there's, you know, someone out there that, uh, Lord, received you this morning, God, that you would just continue to walk by their side. Lord, the different situations that we find ourselves 
caught up in, Lord. I pray that you continue to be a light. Lord, for that individual that feels like you're not there. God, right now, be there. Let them know that you love them with an unconditional love. Lord, you created them for a purpose. Let them see your purpose in this year of 2020. Lord, for that, we just give you praise and we give you honor and thanksgiving. All of God's children said, amen.